Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our first panel for today. Uh, we're very excited about this one. It is called Replanting Roots, Rebuilding Community, Assyrians in America. Um, an expert panel will explore the early history of Assyrian Americans and how they established cultural, social, and political institutions to foster a sense of community far from the lands they once called home. And moderating this panel is my friend and colleague, Jamie Bahura. Shalom Aluchun, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. If I can welcome our, our panelists to come on the stage with me. Um, thank you, Rain, for the introduction. Uh, let's give them all a round of applause as they come up. <laughs> okay, so I hope um, you have all found the past two days engaging and inspiring. I personally have really enjoyed hearing from our amazing speakers. We've heard so many stories in you know, their personal lives and their areas of expertise, um, and they're always very uh, stirring and inspiring. So today, continuing on with some of the discussions that we've started yesterday, uh, we're going to explore in more detail our diaspora communities. Beginning at the end of the 19th century, uh, with an influx during the Assyrian Genocide, the widespread persecution of Assyrians in the Ottoman Empire and Persia led to their immigration to the United States. Many Assyrians seeking refuge found their way to growing populations in California, Massachusetts, New York, Illinois, and I have to plug my home state, Michigan. Um, this expert panel will explore the early history of Assyrian Americans and how they established cultural, social, and political institutions to foster that sense of community far from the lands they once called home. So please join me in welcoming our panel, Dr. Sargon Donabed, Joseph Hermes, Dr. Ariana Shaya, and Dr. Ruth Kembar. So the format's gonna be a little bit different from our, our nice chair situation yesterday. Um, we have some brilliant academics with us today, so they're going to, to uh, grace us with some, some awesome lectures, uh, which I'm really excited to hear. Um, so first, we are welcoming Dr. Sargon Donabed. Uh, Sargon Donabed is a writer and academic with a PhD from the University of Toronto in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations and an MS in Anthropology from Canisius College. His work focuses on the notions of re-enchanting, rewilding, and importance of storytelling. A proponent of panentheism and hasenity, hasen you want to correct me on that? Hiacity. Hiacity. <laughs> this is a not easy bio to read, but we're with academics, so it's understandable. Um, Donabed has created a notion of Pan and historicism as a new historical paradigm in an effort to reimagine divine imminence in the ordinary and its transcendence through mystery, rekindling wonder. He's an expert on the perennial culture and heritage of Assyria and Assyrians and co-founder of the Assyrian Studies Association. His contemporary focus consists of indigenous and marginalized communities, but also threads of continuity from the ancient to the modern period. Donabed is an associate professor of history and cultural studies at Roger Williams University. So I hope you all have had the chance this weekend to speak with him, but we're really excited to, to hear from him lecture style. So take us back to school, Dr. Donabed. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you to uh, the Assyrian Policy. Can I walk and talk? I'm loud. Can you, you want me to talk? You picked the Luddite to do this, so I apologize. Um, thank you, everyone. I want to say thank you to, thank you very much, Jamie, for the introduction. Uh, I don't know, that was the funny bio that uh, I usually give at fantasy conferences, so <laughs> sorry about that one. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much to the Assyrian Policy Institute for holding this. Um, I just wanted to say uh, very briefly, um, uh, Tau diste lano shit kitlan harke me rahopo. Um, thank you 
على مدوناني و على صوبه سيمينا ميدي حاثو بثر دو ميدانوت اسيريان بوليسي انستيتوت كونفرنس سو ثانك يو جايز فيري ماتش اجين اي وانتد تو سي وان ثينغ اباوت ذس ذس فيرست اي ام جست غونا ووك اند توك بيكوز ذاتس وات اي دو بت ذس فيرست بيكتشر هاف ا بانش بيكتشرز فور يو جايز توكينغ ا ليتل بيت اباوت اسيريان كولتشرال هيستوري بيسيكلي Um, through photographs. So I wanted to put these up here. This was actually from a presentation that I had given a long time ago um, at a MESA conference, Middle East Studies Association conference, and I entitled it, Sayedna, Who Are We? Navigating Sectarian Politics in the United States. And I left that up because, I left that up because I thought it was hilarious, but I don't know if this is working. Ah, okay, cool. Oh, you moved it. Okay. Um, so in any case, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Assyrian community of Harput and how it moved to the United States um, from southeast Turkey. Uh, Harput is about as far away, sorry, I didn't put up the map. It's about as far as way, away from the Assyrian homeland as you can get while still being Assyrian. Uh, that's pretty much the way I always think about it. It's a two-hour Dolmush ride from Diyarbakir going north. Um, Most of my family came from there, and they ended up in, in the Massachusetts area. I'm also going to do a little bit of a foray into the community of Rhode Island, which there was a Nestorian community in Rhode Island, uh, and still is a little bit today. Um, and just briefly talk about New Jersey, a little bit about New Jersey, the community that came from D.R. Becker. Um, and you'll see a couple of photographs of, as well from the Nestorians who went to Fresno, also Nestorians from Harput, but who ended up in Fre Los Angeles and Fresno. It's a community that very few people know anything about. Um, so, uh, very briefly, the Assyrians from Harputz began immigrating from the Ottoman Empire to the United States in the late 1800s. The first handful of people that came, uh, the, the sort of the folklore, folklore, folkloric story about who they are and what they are started with the Assyrian Five Association. Uh, and the Assyrian Five Association was uh, supposedly uh, the first five Assyrians who came from Harput, five men who came from Harput to sort of settle uh, in Massachusetts and create a community outside of this town of Harput. Now, this is uh, an old picture from, this is the church of um, Maremana. So this is the uh, church of the Virgin Mary in Harput. Um, this is obviously pre-destruction, pre-Saifo. Um, you can see the, you see the houses off to the, to the right there. Uh, the reason I wanted to show this was because you'll see that the destruction over time, none of the stuff on the right exists anymore. Uh, the church still exists, but the community from Harput was not a continuously regenerating community. Uh, this is not a community that continuously moved from the homeland to the United States. Once SAFO occurred between 1915, 1914, 1919-ish, uh, after that time period, there were no more Assyrians in Harput. There were no more Armenians in Harput. There were also Armenians in Harput. Uh, the town was more or less Uh, emptied and bit by bit was destroyed or pulled down. So, could we go to the next one? I'm sorry, Otto, is that? So I'm going to give you guys some interesting examples of, of just how deep this history goes. Uh, this is an example of uh, the name and family tree. So there are a variety of Assyrian families who had come from Harput and immigrated to the United States. The name and family is one of them. Uh, and this was sent to me by one of the uh, name and family members. And it was very interesting because, of course, at the top you have the, the Assyrian. Right under it you have uh, Armenian because the Assyrians from Harput, many of them also intermarried with Armenians. Uh, and this is an entire family tree. What's really fantastic about this, of course, is that these latter generations we know next to nothing about. Uh, most of them have assimilated into American culture, as it typically happens. Um, but the fact that we actually have some sort of historical record for them and their family is really fantastic. Uh, most families from Harpo do not have this family tree. Um, we have a partial one in my family, but this is probably one of the most uh, detail, well-detailed ones I've, I've seen. Um, can we go to the next one, Audrey? Um, so Harpo re really quickly was, the, was a center for missionary activity. There was a college in Harput um, that was created by, by uh, missionaries, and it was called, originally it was Euphra uh, excuse me, Armenia College, and Armenia College was created to create essentially Armenian uh, Protestant priests. 
They changed the name to Euphrates College, and in fact, there were actually two Assyrians who taught at Euphrates College that we know of. One was Asher Yusuf, many of you have heard of Asher Yusuf, who created Murshid Athurion. Uh, the second was a man by the name of Yehia Donabed, who was uh, also a professor. The others were predominantly Armenian um, and a couple of Americans as well. So this is just an example of some of the stuff that, that uh, uh, the Assyrians brought with them. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that we, don't, we have, I think, one or two of these or examples of this that still exist today. This was taken from an Assyrian family, but there are some Armenians who have this as well, sort of left over. But this type of cultural history is the stuff that we've been trying to preserve for quite some time now, and we've started to do more and more of this with the Assyrian Studies Association. Oh, fantastic. So this is, this is what's left today. Thank you, Jane. This is what's left today. So Assyrian Church of the Virgin Mary in Harput. These are two pictures from the um, uh, early 1900s. Uh, that was a picture that I took in 2003. So you can just see that's the church. That's the hillside. There's nothing left. Um, it's not. Uh, no, it's OK. Can we go to the next? Oh, thank you. Um, this is how full the town was. I'm just going to give you guys quick examples. That no longer exists. It's completely empty. So the Assyrians basically moved from, uh, can we go to the next one? Going from um, a town, a full town, of Assyrians, Armenians, uh, Turkish immigrants to basically next to nothing in the entire community for the most part immigrated first to, migrated first to Istanbul and then from Istanbul to the United States. This is an example of uh, a family member of mine, Elias Donovan, this is my father's uncle, um, uh, maternal, uh, sorry, uh, paternal uncle, um, just to show you some of the, the information. They immigrated initially to um, most of them to Ellis Island, some of them also directly to Massachusetts. Um, if you guys can see up here, uh, can you see the, it, in the early uh, declarations of attention, they had both race and nationality. If you can see race up there, it says Assyrian, and then it says nationality Turkish. Really, really interesting. Um, can you go to the next one, Andre? So really quick, Assyrians of Massachusetts. This is the original Assyrian church in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I took this picture about 10 years ago. It's now an evangelical church um, of a uh, Latinx community. Uh, this, is the, this is the only thing that's left of the church today, but I'll show you another piece on the next, uh, next couple of slides. Um, the Assyrians created a variety of institutions. First was the church, or one of the first was, was the church, but they actually had three prior to creating their, the church in Massachusetts. Um, they had the Assyrian Benevolent Association, uh, the Assyrian Five Association, and early on the Harput, the Assyrian Harput Association. Um, this organization, if you can see here, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, be, it, be it known that Arthur Shavur, Elton George, Yuhanna Malik, Nishan Ohan, this is also fantastic because now we have last names of Assyrians that we didn't have before. Um, George Donabed, um, woohoo, George Ovanis, uh, the Denha family, uh, the Barsam family, and the Naaman family. Uh, major families of Harput that had immigrated to the United States and created one of the first associations that united all of the original Assyrian associations of Harput, because there were many of them, under the United Assyrian Association of Massachusetts with, and this is great because this is the early 1900s, um, to enliven the Assyrian spirit and to promote the intellectual, moral, and civic welfare of the Assyrian people. Wonderful early 1900s. Can we go to the next one? Um, Assyrians participated in a variety of things. Uh, when I originally created this slide, it was funny because we, we had an, an issue of how people understood the Assyrians as they immigrated. And initially, people were confused because when I say Assyrians, of course, unfortunately, the academic context is Nestorian. Um, these are all the Assyrians of Harput were of the Jacobite right. I'm gonna use Jacobite because I equally dislike the term Syrian or Syriac Orthodox. Um, these are people of the today's known as Syrian or Syriac Orthodox Church. The original name of the church, as it moved to the United States, was the Assyrian Apostolic Church of Antioch. That's what it was called uniformly when it first came to the United States. The church in Worcester, Massachusetts was one of the first that was built, uh, as was the one in New Jersey. The people of New Jersey mostly came from Diyarbakir. Those from Harput immigrated mostly to Massachusetts. This is from Massachusetts. 
And this is an example of Assyrians, small community, that participated in the armed forces. Those first handful of years, first 20 some odd years. And this still exists today in the Assyrian church um, in Worcester, which moved to Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Um, just as an FYI, that church's name is no longer Assyrian. It's now called Syriac Orthodox. But this is evidence of the initial understanding, the emic understanding, the notion of who and what these Assyrians were. Um, also, I would like everyone to look at some of the names, if you can see some of the names. Okay, well, my name's there. Sargon, <laughs> Ashur, uh, Sargon, Nimrud, um, there's three or four Sargons, Barsom. Um, you can see a lot of them are American names, but you also have a significant amount or a handful of very typically Assyrian names. What's interesting about that as well is that we don't see as much of that from Assyrian records in the early 19, 1920s, 1930s. Um, so uh, further evidence that Assyrians beyond the, uh, could we go to the next one, beyond the, um, the Church of the East were using these, these names. This is the grand opening of the church. Constitution and bylaws of the church. You can see St. Mary's Assyrian Apostolic Church Incorporated. Um, they started using the term Orthodox in the first dozen or so years afterwards because they started to change the name of the church um, as it moved. These three pictures on the left, very fascinating. So you have patriarch, bishop of the church, patriarch of the church, bishop of the church, and right center of those two. So this is the original, see that church? Remember the church sign at the beginning? That's, this is the same church from the grand opening. The flag over on the left-hand side was the original Assyrian flag that they used to use. Um, but that picture in the middle is really great because you have these two church figures and right in the center you have Dr. Um, Abraham K. Yusuf, who was one of the attendees of the Paris Peace Conference. Um, very interesting because the assumption has always been that Assyrians were so religiously oriented when they first came and moved to the west because that's what they were in the east the fact that you have front and center in the middle of the two religious figures, um, a secular figure, I think is very, very fascinating. So, so you can understand the mentality of the people from this region. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. Uh, just an example of a ba baptismal font um, and one of the organizations that exist as early as 1934, the Assyrian Women's Progressive Club. Could we go to the next one? Uh, I, it, progressive also was slightly different back then. Um, <laughs> examples of Assyrians who participated uh, during the draft, the draft registration. Um, this is the Safar family um, and the Perch family. Uh, can we go to the next one, Otto? Thank you. Uh, United Assyrian Association of Massachusetts, early membership cards is from 1948, Elton George. Um, can we go to the next one? Yeah, we can skip that one. That's a later association that occurred um, in the 60s. Um, Assyrian, church uh, Assyrian Ladies Church Loving Association uh, from 1908. 1908. Can we go to the next one? Interesting. So uh, the assumption was that Assyrians were and have always been very, very sectarianized or balkanized, if you want to use that term. There are two pictures like this that exist. One, the Assyrians of Harput in Massachusetts two Assyrians of Harput in, Fres in, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, both of these pictures are ro large rollout pictures that we found oh, maybe 20 something years ago. Um, my friend and I, uh, Firas Jatu and I, originally scanned them for, for a book that I did, uh, I think when I was doing my undergraduate. But what's really fascinating about this, if you can all see it, Assyrians of Harput did not speak Assyrian, did not know Assyrian. They spoke Armenian and Turkish. Typically, they wrote in Garshuni, which was Assyrian script, but Ottoman Turkish language, or sometimes uh, uh, Armenian. Assyrian script at the top, telling basically the same thing that it says underneath it. Harput Assyrian United Association of America, outing, honoring Lady Surma, the, uh, the Bet Marshamun, okay, 1926. These are Jacobites honoring the head of the Nestorian church. You ever see that today? See that in the past 20 years, 50 years, 70 years? Can we go to the next one, please? Even more interesting, annual outing Assyrian National Union, Worcester Boston branch, so they had multiple unions, and Worcester Ladies Auxiliary, 
at Bushara Perch's farm. This is Bishara. I typically wrote Bushara for some reason. 1935. Look at what they were sending money to. Benefit for Marshamun, the 21st patriotic leader for a new Assyria. I'm not saying I agree with having a church leader run Assyria. What I'm showing you is the fact that they went beyond their ecclesiastical boundaries to have a sense of being Assyrian that was at the very ground level, at sort of a common denominator. The Assyrian thing came first for them. The ecclesiastical distinctions came after. This probably catapulted also, my argument would be, they probably catapulted the church into starting to change its name over time. Um, but this is a very interesting piece. We don't have a ton of this evidence, but we have enough of it from Harput. Could we do the, thank you. Um, these are just others that I'm gonna, we'll probably go through just really quick because I think I have like two minutes left. Um, this is a Syrian Five Association. Uh, you can see the influence of Armenian at the top. They, Assyrians from Harput understood Armenian better than, than Assyrian, and so that's what they typically wrote in. I just use this as an example. You can see here, Shotha Puset Khamsha, Aturaye, and then if you can see the last piece there, Biboston, okay? And then you have this piece just to show you how they interchange the terminology, Suryoyet Hamsho. They did not have an issue using Aturaya, Othoroyo, Suryoyo, Suroyo. They use them interchangeably. That's the stamp. Um, and the other piece, uh, both of them utilize at the same time period. Um, New Jersey, church in New Jersey, just so you can see it. Um, very interesting, so you see at the top the Assyrian. Eito Shli Heito, Morth Mariam, very interesting, the usage of the term. Da Othoroye, Trisath, it's supposed to be Trisath, but Tris Shubho. Um, so basically Assyrian Orthodox Church or Apostolic Church, that's how they translated it, um, of the Virgin Mary in uh, New Jersey. Oh, we can talk more about that later, but what's really cool about this is that they said Morth Mariam. No one uses that in the Syriac Orthodox Church today. They all use Yoldath Alohu. Um, we can talk about that after, but it's a very interesting thing. Uh, Assyrian Apostolic Church, we go, just go, we can go them like, could you do them like every five seconds? <laughs> just so I can go through them quick, thank you. Um, Assyrian Apostolic Church of the Virgin Mary, so you can see the terminologies that they use. This is the community from New Jersey. Um, they came from Dierbecker, so not too far away. Um, same piece. Uh, you can see the slow change in the 50s to Assyrian Orthodox Archdiocese. Um, an example of the Assyrian publications that were done at the time, this is the Assyrian Progress, which we have the majority of them, with the Mara Project and also the Assyrian Studies Association's uh, Archive Project. Um, we can skip that, that's a census account we can go back to. Nineveh Magazine, um, which was a monthly publication dedicated, devoted to the Assyrian people, again from Boston. Um, this is 1927, all written in Armenian. Interesting. Assyrians in Rhode Island mostly came from uh, Midyat uh, in Turabdin, uh, some from Mardin as well. Just wanted to show you guys this, just because it's fascinating. The, uh, the earliest ones came from, oh sorry, thank you. Uh, the, earliest, the earliest organizations, Jacobite Apostolic uh, Church of St. Ephraim, um, all of it eventually changes in the 50s, but just to show you from the early 19, no, 1913 on, we had a significant Assyrian community in uh, New Jersey. All of them are Syriac Orthodox today. Um, same family, Jacob Denho, also comes from, from that, that's fine, you can go through those. Uh, that's the Denho family as well from Rhode Island, again, that came from, from Torabdin. Uh, census accounts, I won't go through them now, but just wanted to point out, almost all the early Assyrian community came from Harput, Diyarbakir, and listed place of origin as Assyria. Not Turkey, not Ottoman Empire, not something else, Assyria. And in almost all the census accounts, some census taker eventually went through it and crossed out the A and the S at the beginning, which is very, very interesting. So we know that there was some sort of a reason that they, that some sort of an effort to do that, possibly because somebody eventually in the office realized, oh wait, there's no actual country named Assyria. But that means that it was done secondarily, right? After the fact, meaning that they all introduced themselves as Assyrian. That's very fascinating. Again, some more magazines, the new Assyria, uh, that Assyrians of Harput and Diyarbakir participated in, also with an Eastern Assyrian, Joel Werda, um, you can see at the top there, who was a, a, a Protestant minister. 
Um, and these were folks mostly in LA and Fresno who were working with him. We'll go to the next one. And I'm just going to end with this cool one because I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> I love martial arts. Um, in Los Angeles and in uh, Fresno, the community that lived there, now it's vastly an Eastern Assyrian community, you all know that, right? Meaning people from Urmia, Haikari, Iraq, and that region. These folks sort of, sort of disappeared into Fresno and Los Angeles, but um, they were very well known in the region. Glenn Hoyan was one of the best Okinawan, Goju Ryu karate fighters in the region um, and was in a variety of movies at the time. Um, Glenn was one of them. There was another uh, well-known family, the Perch family, that started the, um, the Sunny Burgle family, Sunnyvale Burgle, Burgle uh, family. Very, very interesting. One of the biggest Burgle wheat, as, like Gurgur, Burgle, uh, wheat uh, producers in the whole region. Um, I just wanted to point out these pieces. I went through them quickly just to show you guys that the Assyrians immigrated to the United States, kept their Assyrian identity from these various places, but also began to think of ways in which they could both integrate themselves into the United States, but also carry on with a sense of Assyrian identity as they moved forward. And they moved it into everything they did. Karate expert, well-known Assyrian. Um, their churches, their associations, and whatever else they did, it all sort of came with them. It was always a piece and part of what they did. Um, the community today is a little bit less so active, but we can talk about the reasons for that later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donabed. I'm going to redeem myself. Hexiety, panentheism, and I have to correct myself. He had an MS in anthrozoology, which I think I read very quickly. Yeah, I like animals more than humans. That's very cool. So I, I'm redeeming myself there. So I, I, apparently I not only need to work on my Sudeth, but also my English somehow. <laughs> So excited, uh, eventually, Dr. Donabed, you'll have to, to tell us more about, about all of those interesting things. Um, next up, we have Dr. Ruth Kambar. Ruth Kambar is a second generation Assyrian American. She earned her PhD from New York University in 2013, creating a verbal monument to Assyrian Americans, a family archive construction of identity in the Assyrian American diaspora. Ruth analyzed a collection of life narratives and complementary texts which provided a unique window into an immigrant Assyrian family and its Assyrian American identity. In 2017, Dr. Kambar co collaborated with Kathy Yako in curating photography and narrative for the art exhibit, Assyrians and Yonkers, at the Blue Door Gallery. In 2019, she published Assyrians of Yonkers, contributing to Arcadia Publishing's Images of America series, which hopefully some of you were able to pick up this uh, weekend. Uh, in 2020, Dr. Kembar began to work collaboratively with Annie Elias, who you heard from yesterday, on creating a narrative window into the lives of Assyrians in the American colonies, as documented by John Baba of Chicago. In a 1937 film, Assyrians in Motion, which we had playing on repeat during their talk yesterday, I had a really good time watching that, and I hope you all did too. Dr. Kembar and Ms. Elias documented, received a grant from ASA to complete their work. Currently, Dr. Kembar serves on board of directors of the Assyrian Studies Association and in that capacity as chairperson of the ASA archive. As such, she is collaborating with an international team to continue to add to and digitize the ASA archive. Additionally, Dr. Kambar and a team of fellow researchers have received a California State Humanities Grant in kind with California State University. <laughs> She is working with this team to curate, catalog, and exhibit the Assyrian Genocide exhibition, Tell Our Stories, Artifacts from the Assyrian Genocide, 1895 through 1924, opening on June 30th and running through August 7th, 2022, at California State University Stanislaus. So hopefully uh, we'll see you all in Turlock to, to go visit. Thank you, Dr. Kenbar. Good morning, everybody. So I wanted to show you where we started, and this is in Ermia. This is the graduating class uh, from the seminary. And the reason I picked this picture, the third man from the left on the first row became our Gasha in Yonkers. And that's Marshall Yako. He lived in Chicago for a while with his sister and Shalom, and they moved to Yonkers to take the job at the Assyrian Presbyterian Church. Before he came to Yonkers, the Assyrians set up a church in the Hungarian church. They would meet 
as a congregation at one o'clock in the afternoon and have this space. There were only 30 Assyrians in Yonkers in 1903. By 1933, there were 300. A little while after, excuse me, in, in 1915, there were 300. In 1933, we had 250 families. So it was a small community, but they really did everything together. So initially, it was the Presbyterians that came to Yonkers. And, and so I'm going to get closer. There's, I left my glasses at home. Um, so I wanted to so many Assyrians, because they didn't have a place, they went to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. They went to uh, St. John's Episcopal Church. There was a fallout, and it had to do with a minister and the choice of minister in the Presbytery, in the Presbyterian Church. And so some people actually changed their churches. And so we had people at St. Andrews, we had people at St. John's down in Getty Square, we had people, believe it or not, at South Presbyterian Church, which was a Scottish Assyrian Presbyterian Church. Those congregations eventually merged. So this is an article about St. Andrews and how Isaac Yohannan, who was one of the first ministers who preached to Assyrians at St. John's, again in the afternoon, separate from the regular congregation there. Eventually, those congregations merged. So there wasn't a one o'clock. People then got baptized in the churches, et cetera, and they were basically swallowed up by the churches that they joined. This is an article about that. Okay. We also have at the Young Men's Christian Association, there was a men's meeting, the Book of Books, and Isaac Yohannan was speaking to the 300 Assyrians in Yonkers and to Americans about who Assyrians were. A probation officer came to basically threaten <laughs> the Assyrians. There was this idea that we were perceived as maybe, maybe going against the American government. And so he comes to talk about how important it is um, to have evening schools in the English language, et cetera. And this was at the first Reformed Church on South Broadway, yet another church. So this picture, I cut it. But these are the men in the picture. The man in the middle is actually one of my great uncles who died during the period of influenza in 1919. And uh, that's Samuel Jacobs. His real name was Esmile. They changed the name to Jacobs uh, later on. These are some of his associates. Uh, some of the other men that I cut out actually look like uh, wise guys. Um, not Assyrians, and he was a businessman. This is him, he opened a cafe. They had a nickname because of the cost of everything. They used to call it Chemsha. And so people went into this restaurant and it eventually became a speakeasy during the 1920s. His brother took it over. He was not, um, alive at the time he passed. Okay. So this is his brother, David Jacobs, right here. And Isaac Yonan, uh, known as Izzy. And we have uh, Sam Aslan, Joseph Derna, and David Purley. This is the Federation. They're discussing the Federation papers in response um, from the Assyrian American Association. They decided to join the Federation, create it. They're holding the Federation papers here. Now, uh, they performed Assyrian shows to each other, but they also, and you can see the integration of Americanism. Tom Sawyer. How would you like to see a show of Tom Sawyer in Assyrian? <laughs> and here they're marking the anniversary. So they opened the Yonkers Association in 1914. It was established and it was a secular organization. I would like to read to you what their mission was. 
And I personally think it's extremely important to have both. To have a cultural identity separate from churches because it also solidifies who we are together rather than the separate churches that everybody belong to in Yonkers. One sec. We, the members of the Assyrian American Association of Yonkers, as Assyrians living in this community and fully realizing our responsibilities, find a feed for a united and common cause. We promise to uphold the Constitution and accordingly certify and accept and subscribe, this is later, to the Assyrian American Federation and the declaration of its principles and that we should further promise to dedicate ourselves to the perpetuation of the Assyrian language, heritage, and our culture to aid to the needy Assyrian people of Assyrian people of Assyrian descent, wherever they may be, and to keep alive in the Assyrian people a spirit and realization of the need for their unity without prejudice as to religious or political affiliation. We also state our allegiance to the United States of America and its constitution, and that we should not advocate or belong to any group or organization advocating to overthrow the United States of America by force, <laughs> both foreign and democratic. Okay. This is the congregation at the Assyrian Presbyterian Church. Um, and uh, these are basically, this is the generation of my grandparents. And my grandparents are in the picture, all four. And uh, this is the Assyrian Presbyterian Church. Eventually, they bought a building on South Broadway, which was a federal bank, and they turned it into their own church. I did think it was huge when I was a child, and I now realize <laughs> how small it is. But we often had dinners every Sunday after church. That's where we gathered, we went there, and when that got swallowed up because of politics in Yonkers and integration forced busing, caused a lot of white flight in Yonkers, unfortunately, and the Assyrian Presbyterian's children did not stay around. So they're outside of Yonkers, and eventually we lead to another church, and I'll explain that in a second. So I, I thought I would share this with you because it's really an image of Yonkers in the 20s. This is my father. And um, there was a man that would come around and ask you if you would pay to have pony pictures. My poor father wasn't even a year old yet, and they stuck him on this horse. He does not look happy. Okay. This is the woman's organization. This is actually at the association. Um, my mom, Lydia, and my grandmother, Blendina. Thank you. And Marshman was closely linked to the Jacobs family, and that's Dave Jacobs' family in this picture. He came to visit. They had several dinners for him. The churches united, which was very nice. Here's the brochure, it was 1940. These are the women, uh, this is the Women's Association. It's a spin-off or an affiliate of the Assyrian American Association. It was interesting that the women, didn't, they didn't really belong to the Assyrian American Association. They had their own organization, but they met in the building. Uh, you can't see the names, but this is actually Gasha Yako's bookmark for his Bible. Those are the names of the congregants. He had them on his bookmark. This was the bank that they bought and turned into their church. I, I'm, okay, I didn't hear if there was a question. So they advocated, and in the 70s, they were letting people know who they were, all right? So they had interviews, they were celebrating anniversaries of the association in the papers, this is 1973. 
And I did want to tell you a little about this. So in the 70s, the Assyrian Presbyterian Church basically collapsed and merged totally with the South Presbyterian Church. Uh, South Presbyterian Church had had a fire in it when I was a child, and they looked to the Assyrian Presbyterian Church for pews. And so this pew, my father was very, very proud, has his initials from when he was a little boy raised in the Assyrian Presbyterian Church. So that, that pew ended up in the church that I was raised in. There were picnics all the time. I own that samovar. Um, that samovar went to every picnic. Everyone brought their samovars, you know. In the 70s, Marmari broke, its, uh, broke ground and created its church. They had been in another building, and they moved to create their own church as well. This is their group. They put on plays. These are the students, the children. So one of my students, actually, um, I found out he's a Syrian, and he didn't think anyone knew it. And when he told one teacher, they said, oh, you have to meet Ruth Kambar. And I showed him the book. It had just been published. His dad is in this picture, and his aunt. He was so proud. And this is a picture that really shows some of the, mer the merging. Um, these are Assyrians and Scottish people at the South Presbyterian Church. This is our group today in Yonkers, and we all gather for uh, the Assyrian flag raising in April. We celebrate the Assyrian New Year, and we also um, the, we commemorate the anniversary of the Assyrian Association. Most of these people are from Marmari's congregation. This is their proclamation at City Hall. Very, very proud to solidify that. And I think this is the end. This is just a picture to show that people still return to Iran today. This is a celebration of Dukhrana. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. And here is the exhibit we had at Blue Door Gallery and uh, some of the Assyrians that came. We actually had the largest opening that the gallery ever had. And the association, we invited people. People flew in from California, Chicago. I, I never expected what we got. Sargon came and spoke, and Alda, right? Alda, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're so bad. And uh, we showed a film, her film. And so we broke the record at the gallery, but we had so many people show up for the club, for the dinner the night before, that we were sitting on the floor. And all of those people that fled Yonkers came. And so sometimes I think it's just about extending invites and setting up house and bringing people together. And that's what I'm going to be working on next. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kambar. I think it's a, a beautiful thing when we are able to see our history through photos and films. It really bring, brings to life uh, the experiences of our ancestors and, and helps us have a, a slight glimpse into their lives. Next up, we have uh, Joseph Hermes. Joseph is a PhD candidate with a focus on late Ottoman and modern Middle Eastern history in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization at the University of Chicago. His current research focuses on the political and social history of the Assyrians during World War I. Joseph completed his master's degree at the University of Chicago in 2016, writing on the intersection of identity and archaeology in the published works of Assyrian archaeologist and diplomat Hormuz Dursam. Please, round of applause for Joseph. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm gonna follow uh, Dr. Sargon and Ruth's lead here and, and just present mine uh, standing up. So I, I do wanna extend thanks again to the Assyrian Policy Institute uh, for inviting me. And I hope you all enjoyed today's lecture. Unfortunately, my lecture today won't focus uh, too much on the sort of general history of the Assyrians of Chicago, but more a particular episode uh, that I think uh, opens the door to further research on the community in the United States, uh, so looking even beyond 
uh, the context of Chicago. But I do have some interesting photos here I wanted to share. So these photos are all from the 1930s. Uh, from Agajan Baba, who we mentioned yesterday, who was the gentleman who went around the United States in the 19, 1937 to record the community. And, you know, we see the Assyrian school here. This is, for anyone who's familiar with Chicago, was on Mononymy Street, or Orleans and Mononymy in sort of the downtown area. And then in the upper right corner, we have the Assyrian Central Committee uh, raising money for uh, Mayor Kelly of Chicago. So, so I, I do want to highlight a few individuals that I think play a really important role uh, in the history of the or the early history of the Assyrian community in Chicago. And the gentleman you see here is the late Reverend Paul Newey. Uh, Reverend Paul Newey was a Protestant minister trained in the United States, sent from Iran to the United States was trained in Minnesota, relocated to Chicago, where he established a printing press, and beginning in 1915, started to publish the Assyrian American Herald, which was the first weekly Assyrian newspaper published in the world. And it was published until about 1921, 1922, when his work as the minister for the Assyrian United Evangelical Church really took off, and that was a church that was located uh, in the Edgewater uh, area of Chicago. It was a very historic church that opened in the 1920s. Unfortunately, it was sold, I think, a year or so ago and by a sort of condo developer and was destroyed. And now a new, brand new condo building is going in its place, which speaks to a lot of things that are happening in Chicago generally and I think even in the United States. But this was his newspaper here, the Assyrian American Herald. So this issue is from April 26, 1918. So this is actually reporting the assassination of Marbin Yamin Shimon, right? So you have to remember news, you know, doesn't spread as quickly as, uh, as it does today. And so once, you know, official reports were confirmed, you know, they, they actually published uh, a couple of special issues on the topic. We see here uh, the masthead, uh, which changes, right? So originally it was Jerchi uh, Suryaya, uh, and then Jerchi, of course, being the same word as Meshkadana or Herald, was changed. Uh, it became Meshkadana. And then by 1920, uh, we see Aturaya being very explicitly written uh, for the paper. But of course, throughout the entire period, it was always known as the Assyrian American Herald. And here it's uh, the last address location was 949 Rush Street. Again, for anyone who's ever been to the Chicago area, this is sort of the heart of um, like kind of the River North area and you know, very posh, super high end area. But in the 1910s and 20s was an area where many immigrant communities settled and that's essentially where the Assyrian community was located uh, for many years. And, and those who were able to um, you know, economically progress were able to move out further north into the city. You know, I found a newspaper clipping from uh, Meshkadana in the 1910s talking about Assyrians buying property lots in Evanston, Illinois, you know, and how Evanston was such a nice place and encouraging Assyrians to relocate to Evanston in the 1910s. So, uh, the first Assyrian-owned property in the city of Chicago was also a Presbyterian church, uh, and it was the Carter Assyrian Church, uh, and it was built in 1906. So for those of you who may or may not know, the early immigrants to the Chicago area were mostly Assyrians from Iran, but there were also some Assyrians from the Tchuma region in Turkey who relocated to Chicago, and, and they're actually the first priest, Qasha Haydu Ablahat, was Tchumnaya, uh, and he was a Presbyterian trained minister. And this is the church here, 54 West Huron Street. This church actually remained for many years, I think, you know, before it also was demolished about three or four years ago, was a hair salon. Um, but the Carter Church is still around. Unfortunately, it merged with another Presbyterian church, uh, and it's uh, located in the Saganash area, uh, so in sort of the north, uh, north, far north side of the city. And uh, its Assyrian congregation has dwindled uh, pretty significantly. But it, it's sort of historically important because it was the first building in the city of Chicago that Assyrians built themselves and owned outright. Um, and that was uh, in part uh, 
obviously the, the sort of vigor of the community to have their own property, but also sort of, an, you know, I, I, I was told a story by a sort of an Assyrian old timer. So the Assyrians who originally came to Chicago would attend Fourth Presbyterian Church in the sort of the downtown area. And, you know, once the community started to grow in the early 1900s, you know, these uh, old time Presbyterians were like, you know, a lot, a lot of brown people are starting to show up at this church. Maybe we should just give them their own church. And so Carter uh, was their solution to sort of keeping them close, but not too close. Uh, and of course, the Assyrians of Chicago played an important role um, in the post-World War I period as well. Uh, we see here, you know, the, from the Chicago Tribune referring to them as Persians, but uh, this is actually Kasha Paul Nui right here, right, welcoming uh, Jesse Malik Yonan, right? So I think related to Rosie Malik Yonan, as he was returning from France uh, from the peace conference meetings. Uh, and, you know, so Assyrians of Chicago definitely um, played an important role in not only organizing during the First World War period, but also sending delegates and, and trying to put claims forward uh, to achieve some sort of relief for the community in the post-war period. And of course, we know that the city of Chicago uh, was home to two Assyrian patriarchs. Uh, on the right, the late Marishe Shumun, who had established um, his headquarters on Sheridan, on the north side of the city, uh, nearby um, Loyola University of Chicago. And you know they purchased the house, and the house sort of functioned as a church as well uh, until he re relocated to the Bay Area some years later. And then, of course, uh, the late Mardanha as well. Um, you know, they established the Cathedral of Mergiwergis in the city of Chicago as well. So, I mean, historically, very significant that two patriarchs of one of the most ancient Christian churches resided in the city of Chicago, and especially a community that had such a robust Assyrian population and still does today. So, if you saw the, the my talk is titled How Assyrians Became White, Racializing Assyrians in Post-World War I America. Now, this is sort of a topic that has you know, gained quite a bit of currency uh, in academic literature in the last 20 odd years. Um, you know, there's like a lot, of, I mean, if you just Google any ethnic group, how they became white, you'll see there's a whole genre of literature out there. And they all sort of focus on sort of various aspects, right? So the famous one, I think it was published probably in the 1980s or early 1990s, uh, how the Irish became white, right? So we know historically the Irish came to America as a result of the potato famine. Uh, when they arrived here in the United States, they were not welcome, uh, they were persecuted, uh, and they themselves come from a country where they were persecuted and fought for their own liberation. But over time, the oppressed became the oppressor, and the Irish took hold of political machines in places like Chicago, New York, and sort of explored that aspect of it. And, you know, so looking at the racial history of Assyrians has been something that's been overlooked uh, in, in a lot of Assyrian scholarship or has been only sort of tangentially addressed. And you know, in our present day, when we are so much more racially conscious, right? there's a lot of discussions happening at a national global level about um, identity and racial politics, uh, this is sort of spilled over into larger discussions. So the, the origins of this talk and this project that I'm working on actually arise out of the 2020 census. So you see this article here from The Atlantic. It says, The Rise of American Others. So there has been a movement, not necessarily coordinated, but almost kind of subconscious, uh, where people are no longer identifying with the sort of main racial categories that are presented to them on government documents, on census sort of petitions, or census questionnaires, and a lot of people are starting to mark other. So for example, you know, sort of think about this, people of Irish descent are marking other and writing Irish instead of writing white. That, that was a phenomenon, and this sort of article talks about that. Or people write, marking other and writing Jamaican rather than marking black, right? So what does that tell us about these racial categories that very much go back to the founding of the United States and how we are now starting to rethink them? And, you know, I, I mean, I know there's a lot of solutions that have been, you know, um, 
put forward by different interest groups, and maybe we can tackle those in the Q&A, but it's definitely an important element. But for our purposes, you know, starting in 1790, the only way to be a, a US citizen or to become a citizen in the United States was if someone was a free white male, right? So that was really sort of the standard way. Of course, slaves, African Americans, were not considered citizens at all. Uh, people who immigrated to the United States, unless they were able to demonstrate in some manner that they were uh, free white people, free white men, uh, there would be sort of no path to citizenship. And, and of course, you know, Scots-Irish, German, people of German descent, that sort of was the bulk of the American population for much of you know, early American history until the 19th century when America sort of opened its doors for all of these Eastern European uh, and also people from the Middle East and other parts of the world, Asia, to start coming to the United States. And it was in the uh, 1800s that uh, there was sort of a, a new revised statute that uh, extended uh, citizenship now to white people or white men, and then also people who of African descent or people descended from slaves, right? So now that sort of opened the door. But sort of how do we now, with large populations of Chinese in the United States, Japanese, uh, different Middle Eastern communities, how do they sort of fit into that model that was set up in the post-Civil War period? And it was a very challenging thing. So oftentimes, many of those people would be admitted to citizenship. But by the early 20th century, there was a very concerted effort uh, by the United States government to question the legitimacy of those claims and to start revoking citizenship. So there's a whole history of litigation and cases, but really it sort of boils down to two major cases that determined uh, who could become a citizen in the United States. And both those cases happened in the post-World World War I period. Uh, we have Takao Azawa v. United States, 1922, and United States v. v, uh, v. Bhagat Singh Thin in 1923. So in the Ozawa case, you have a Japanese immigrant in, I believe, California or Washington who petitioned for U.S. citizenship, was denied uh, on the account that uh, because Japanese people are not of, you know, again, these terms are used very loosely and, you know, without consistency, wasn't considered Caucasian, uh, therefore, he, he was considered Asian or Asiatic, he therefore could not become a citizen because white people are Caucasians, whatever that meant. And he was, his citizenship was revoked. Then in 1923, you have Bhagat Singh Thin, he was a Sikh from India who came to the United States, served honorably, served honorably during World War I, received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and then the United States launched a campaign to revoke his citizenship. And they sort of used a different uh, sort of standard, rather than kind of going this, again, quote unquote, scientific Caucasian racial category. They said, well, although Indians could trace a common ancestor to the Cauca whatever the Caucasian race is, you know, Indians don't look like white people. So they're not white people in the common sense that we understand white people. So therefore, Indians and people from that part of Asia can't become citizens. And so, of course, his citizenship was revoked. Uh, and then this sort of instigated US attorneys across the United States to launch campaigns to start revoking the citizenships of other communities. So, I mean, Armenians were affected by this, Arabs, um, or people from you know, people of Syrian or Lebanese descent uh, were affected by this, and then uh, also Assyrians, as I will briefly show. So here, this is sort of a, a really um, great timeline that's been put together by the Pew Center. I know it's a lot of text. Uh, I'd encourage you, if you just kind of Google um, racial categories and census, uh, you'll see the Pew Center is put together. So we can see in the you know 1790, we had um, you know. For, for what is it? Uh, all other uh, we have free white males, free white females, and then you know free colored males and females by the 1820s or so could become citizens. And then of course we have black, and then you see all the categories that have sort of been created today. And uh, even those are sort of imperfect. And there's um, again been many interest groups that 
have sought to help us revise uh, these categories, and I know the Census Bureau has tried tackling this issue as well. So the case I wanted to talk about um, was the United States v. Shmuel David. This was an Illinois case uh, that was launched in 1923, so only months after the Bhagat Singh Thin decision. Now, maybe, I don't know how many of you may or may not know anything about Reverend Shmuel Dawid, but he was a very prolific Assyrian writer. He was born in the village of Gawilan in Iran in 1872. He was trained as a Catholic priest in France, and he returned to Iran to work uh, as a priest. And then in 1913, there was a growing population of Assyrians of Catholic descent, and so he was sent in 1913 to Chicago to establish a church. Uh, and the church they established was the Church of St. Ephraim, which is still a church that exists today in the city of Chicago. And he served as its first priest. Uh, and he remained there th until he died in 1930. And I mentioned earlier he was a prolific writer. He translated a number of books uh, from English, uh, sort of Catholic literature into Assyrian. Um, he, you know, the one book that stands out to me in importance is a book he wrote, Tashita Atikto Khatta Ator Keldu, which was published in 1923, uh, or the Assyro Chaldean History. Now, mind you, he published this in 1923, so when you, he's reporting or talking about the contemporary things like World War I, the Paris Peace Conference, he's very much involved in those discussions, at least in the Chicago area. He's constantly writing, and the newspaper I showed earlier, Meshkadana Suriyaya or Meshkadana Aturaya, constantly contributing. Almost every week, he's writing some letter, talking about some topic. You know, I mean, he's a prolific writer. And so he was a very well-known member of the community. Uh, and I would argue that you know, th there's a sort of, I think, impulse to say that, you know, the, the David case, right, because it's, I mean, again, to use the word like, it, it's a sort of a sexy case to look at um, and, and to make an argument that, oh, well, you know, it was this one case, you know, or these few cases that sort of determined the racial uh, understanding um, of Assyrians in the United States. And, you know, it is interesting and it's useful uh, to look at cases like that. But I, I think that there's a much longer history uh, that a lot of this scholarship on sort of racial identity overlooks, uh, and, and that sort of, we can sort of trace it back to uh, the homeland, and, and really starts in the 19th century with the arrival of American missionaries. So I'll come back to the David case, uh, because I think it's really important, but it's important that we kind of have some context about where, you know, a lot of these ideas about race and racial identity uh, emerge in the Middle East. So I do have a quote here, and I apologize, I have to walk over to my computer. But we all know that uh, American missionaries arrived in Iran in the you know, middle of the 19th century. Uh, they began to establish their miss mission stations and publish uh, a newspaper in Iran. I think it was the first newspaper published in Iran, Zahir al-Bahra in 1848. And we start to see these ideas about race, which don't really have much of a history in the Middle East, uh, right? Sectarian identity, religion, is a very sort of useful organizing tool uh, in Middle Eastern societies historically. But to start to think about people that these are white people, these are black people, these are whatever, is a new thing. And we see the missionaries start to introduce these ideas in Iran in the 19th century. So in a in the science section of uh, Zahri al-Bahra, or Rays of Light, in December of 1850, there's an anonymous writer who's talking about sort of um, science and identity and peoples, and he writes, quote, the European races' minds are loftier than those of the other races for several reasons. The greatest reason of all is, is true Christianity which has so awakened and sharpened the mind of white people. But it is necessary that we sow seeds of Christianity in the hearts of all nations, as much as we are able to do, 
So then gray people, red people, and black people will mix with one another and also with white people who have more abundant mental gifts until all of them learn and confess that God created all the nations of human beings from one blood. So at the... <laughs> now, I'm, my assumption is that it, I'm not sure if it was an Assyrian who wrote this, right? Because early on in Zahri al-Bahra, Americans who learned Assyrian were, were writing these things. And then later on, Assyrians sort of took on a much more important role in, in newspapers like Zahri al-Bahra. But the fact that it's written in Assyrian and Assyrian is being taught in the schools and these sort of these ideas are now beginning to be introduced to the community. And I think it sort of plays in a, you know, an important role in how Assyrians now bring those ideas of race with them to the United States and start to think about it. And this also plays out even outside of literature, right? So, for example, uh, here's sort of two pictures, an oriental and occidental image of uh, Hormuz Rassam, who was a very famous Assyrian from Mosul. Uh, you know, he assisted Austin Henry Laird uh, in his excavations in Nineveh in the 1840s. Later on, he has a very illustrious career as a British diplomat, then returns to Iraq in the 1870s and 1880s, and does some more extensive uh, archeological work, and then publishes a book in 1897 titled Ashur and the Land of Nimrod, which was sort of his memoirs on his life and his archeological work, his diplomatic work. He spends quite a bit of time also talking about Assyrian history and our community's identity, right? Now, mind you, this is a gentleman who uh, was born into the Chaldean Catholic Church. He later converts and becomes a member of the Church of England, right? Marries an English woman, relocates to England, but maintains a very strong connection with the Rassam family in Mosul, but also a wider networks of Assyrian families in the Middle East. And, and we see, you know, he's a, here's Hormuz Rassam, the proper Englishman, here on the left, and then, of course, Hormuz Rassam Maslawi on the right. Uh, and, and this is a very common theme that we see in a lot of, you know, even with other communities from the Middle East, where uh, for public facing images there, you know, they adapt the attire of sort of uh, high society Westerners. And then of course, they always uh, dress up also in their attire, their native attire, and, and sort of juxtapose the two images with each other. This is also the same case we mentioned Isaac Adams yesterday. And Isaac Adams was, you know, a very charismatic, um, a Syrian uh, Protestant minister, and you know he also publishes two books in 1898. Um, <clears throat> yeah, 18, but the first one was 1898, Darkness and Daybreak, right? And then he republishes pretty much the same book in 1900, Persia by a Persian, and we see these sort of again images, right? So the very dapper looking gentleman here, and then him and his associates, members of his family, dressed in various costumes, right? They always refer to the native clothing as costumes. So it's a very interesting kind of way of portraying uh, one's own background, right? So this is, and this is, and again, this, he's a product of the missionary schools, uh, brings a lot of that with him to uh, the United States where he eventually settles. And uh, I'll let Dr. Ariane Shaya, because she's going to talk a little bit more about him. So, yeah, okay. So I'm wrapping it up right now for all of you. So we have, um, you know, the David case I mentioned earlier was not the first case by any means for Assyrians to, uh, you know, try to get U.S. citizenship or have their citizenship revoked. So these kind of some other examples of it. The ultimate result of the case, uh, the David case, um, was that his citizenship was not revoked. Um, he, you know, he petitioned that he, in fact, was a free white person, that he is of the Assyrian race, but the Assyrian race is a white race, and that therefore, you know, that Assyrians and Assyrians like him should be included. Uh, and and he was able to, um, you know, successfully achieve that. Uh, decision. Of course, um, he could not have done that without the organization of the Assyrian community. So I mentioned Reverend Paul Newey earlier. Uh, he actually was very involved in the case. He recruited um, Albert H. Putney from the American University of Washington right here in DC, who was the head of the Near East Division for the State Department. 
He flew to the United States and served as Reverend David's attorney in the case. Um, there was a lot of press coverage. Sorry, I can't cover it all. I know I need to wrap up. Um, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, you know, so he was able to come to Chicago and, and defend the case. Um, and Reverend David was able to you know, maintain his US citizenship. But, but I think that this sort of opens the door uh, for further research on, on looking on the, the racial history of Assyrians in the United States, because I think it plays an important role, especially after the post-World War I period, when Assyrians are now making claims to the international community. Let's pay attention to the claims that they're making. What are the words that they're using? What are the people that they're sort of associating with? So I'll end it there. Thank you so much again to all the organizers. You've done a wonderful job. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll pass the baton over to Dr. Ariane Shaya. Um, thank you to the future Dr. Hermes. So uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Our final speaker is Dr. Ariana Ishaya. Ariana Ishaya has a PhD in cultural anthropology from UCLA. Her research interests are in the history of the Assyrian diaspora in North America. In 2010, she published two books. The first, New Lamps for Old, is the history of the settlement of Assyrians in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, Canada the very first settlers of the region. Her second book was Familiar Faces in Unfamiliar Places, which is the history of the settlement of Assyrians in Turlock, California. Her most recent work is a biography on William Daniel titled William Daniel, Portrait of an Assyrian Icon, which was published by AASJ in 2015. Ariana has numerous publications in professional journals, encyclopedias, and Assyrian periodicals. She has been very active in Assyrian educational programs sponsored by the various Assyrian organizations in the Bay Area. Presently, she is preparing the three volumes of Katini Gabada for reprinting and Discourse on the Spelling Method in the Assyrian Language by William Daniel. She also has two manuscripts in print. One is the His History of Assyrians in Hamadan, which she has co-authored with Hannibal Gavargis. The other is a translation of The Last Days of Adlakandi, compiled and edited by Eddie Davoud. Dr. Ariana Ishaya. Kadam tochum brichzar rechme mugebe. Tanatunt men teban men API. Kad gadi chidunay thank you slochum. The thing that has impressed me most about this conference is the zeal of this younger generation of Assyrians for the Assyrian cause. It makes me very hopeful because we lament back in California the absence of young uh, people uh, attending our programs. So I don't know if there's a way to inject the zeal back into the, our youth in California. <laughs> uh, today I'm going to introduce you to a vibrant Assyrian community in Turlock located in Central California uh, Valley. Uh, I will start by giving you an, uh, a background introduction to Turlock. By the way, as you see, the grapes at the background of this slideshow uh, symbolize, in a way, the connection between Urmia and Turlock, Assyrians. Uh, Turlock came into existence as a shipping point for the uh, Canadian, uh, to, for the American Pacific Railway in 1871. The village was composed of small scale farmers. Um, these were not subsistence farmers, these were commercial farmers um, fully integrated into the uh, American market economy. Uh, so even though they were called farmers, in fact, they were business people, um, except that they were producing farm products to sell on the market. And um, uh, so they were subject to the flu fluctuations in the prices of their uh, wholesale pro products. So sometimes they were fortunate, but sometimes uh, they had it hard because of the fr fluctuations in the in um, the prices of the markets for their products. By the time the Assyrians arrived in uh, Turlock, Turlock was known as the watermelon capital of the world. So, um, here is a 
picture of uh, Turlock in 1912, and this is a watermelon festival. You will see the pony parade on the street. This is the main street. And um, far away, you will see the tower of uh, the hotel uh, that also served as um, the post office and the library in the, in the town. The streets were unpaved, and one of the people that I was interviewing who came to Turlock in 1920 by the name of Apram Joseph told me that the um, uh, Gear Road, which was the main thoroughfare in Turlock, at that time uh, there was so much sand on it that it came up to the knee. Um, this is, uh, again, the Watermelon Festival, and as you see, there is a watermelon contest, and the person who can get first to the goal gets a prize. Uh, the very first settlers of Turlock were Irish people, and that's how Turlock gets its name. There was a village in Ireland by the name of Turlock, and since Americans cannot pronounce the he sound, so the name of the town turned into Turlock. After the Irish people, large numbers of Swedes came to the town. And in fact, uh, for a long time, Turlock was known as the Sweet Town. After them came the Portuguese, and the Assyrians, Mexican, Americans. And last of all came the Japanese people. So even though it was a multi-ethnic community, uh, but each uh, um, ethnic group uh, kind of segregated itself in their ethnic um, enclave. They practiced their own uh, traditions and customs. They spoke their own language. Outwardly, they looked Americanized because they wore American fashions. Names were changed. Uh, even in the Syrian community, uh, Rebqa became Rebecca, uh, Yuhanna became John, uh, Marian became Mary, and so on. However, this was just the outward shell. Inside, they remained fully ethnic. So the Syrians were uh, practicing their own language at that time and their own customs. The only time that there was a connection, inter-ethnic connection, was in the marketplace and post office at the bank. But the real, the real melting part uh, was in the school, where the, the children learned the, uh, the, Syrian, uh, the English language and had a uniform education. Um, in the first uh, pioneer generation, uh, the, fa uh, the uh, relation between the family uh, kind of was reversed. First, uh, back at home, um, children depended on the parents. But now in America, uh, kind of uh, parents became dependent on the children because they didn't know English, the children knew English, so they were the ones that took their parents shopping and they read the bull and the bills, and uh, uh, they had to translate uh, language to them. So the authority relationships changed a little bit, and this was hard on the parents. My information about the history of the Syrians in Turlock came from the years of research that I did in the 1980s. And uh, there I collected history uh, of the Assyrian families and also did research on the econ economic and political history of Turlock. Now, this picture here symbolizes the theme of the book, which says uh, uh, familiar faces and unfamiliar places. Um, the picture here shows uh, an Assyrian family back in their village eating grapes from their uh, vineyard. Uh, and the background is Turlock, and you will see that there is a, the writing there says California Market. And what I'm trying to show is that the familiar faces in these families and other families that came in Turlock found the, themselves in an environment that was unfamiliar to them. 
uh, the Assyrian uh, uh, community in Turlock was unique in several ways. First of all, uh, unlike the Assyrian settlements in East and Midwest uh, United States, it was established solely as a farming community so that the Assyrians could practice uh, their traditional skills of farming and uh, revive the old way of life. Also, this was a mass settlement, unlike the settlements in the Midwest and in the East, uh, which took place in the form of chain migration, what one family co uh, kind of sponsoring their family members from the old country to come to the United States. This was a mass migration. Um, about 50 people came all together at once to settle in Turlock. The mastermind behind the migration of Assyrians uh, to Turlock was um, a medical missionary uh, by the name of uh, Isaac Adams. He was born in 1872, and he established, uh, uh, he got a degree in the United States in both theology and in medicine. And after graduation, he went back to Iran and opened a school in the village of uh, Wazirawa, where he lived. He was not only highly educated, he was a very resourceful person, published two books, uh, as my friend here mentioned. Uh, one was uh, called uh, Persia by a Persian in two volumes, and the other one was uh, um, Darkness to Day. Day. Um, he was one of the very first cultural brokers in the sense that he introduced Americans to the Persian way of life. And the way that he did that was he traveled throughout the United States, uh, often uh, dressed in uh, the traditional costume. And uh, it was a way of um, uh, gaining some money because as he traveled and lectured, he was offered some funds, and uh, that would enable him to travel from place to place and um, also uh, be able to help the community back uh, in the homeland. In 1900, Isaac Adams marries uh, um, Sarah, who is from a very well-known Assyrian family. And this is his family that he, uh, uh, they, they all grew up in Turlock. Uh, they all married and stayed in Turlock, except Clara, that after marriage she moved to uh, Chicago. The great granddaughter of uh, Isaac Adams, I met her yesterday here. Are you here, Sarah? Yes, please stand up so that everybody is here. Granddaughter, yes. Although Assyrians um, live in different parts of the uh, Middle East, uh, most of them who came to Turlock were from the Urmia region. And this map shows the different the villages. There were about 86 villages here where Assyrians lived. Some of them were purely Assyrian villages. And I have marked um, uh, the town of Urmia, and also I have marked the uh, village of Vazir Wazirawa, where Isaac Adams came from. Uh, this is a, an Assyrian family, traditional Assyrian family, first pioneer generation in the 1920. Uh, let me tell you what happened with Isaac Adams and the um, community that established, he established in Turlock. First of all, he had no intention of doing that. In 1903, he brought about 37 people from Urmia to settle in um, North Battleford, Saskatchewan, in Canada. So he brought about 37 people and established them in the area of North Battleford. And the question is, what made these Assyrians leave their families, 
their villages and come thousand miles away to a new place that they had no way of knowing that they didn't know the language. Well, there are two reasons to explain that. First of all, it's because the Assyrians back in the homeland, they lived in a Muslim community. They were looked upon as second-class citizens and uh, they were discriminated because they were Christians, they were called infidels, untouchables, and also most of the land was owned by Muslim landlords and most Assyrians were farmers, but they were kind of sharecroppers. They didn't have their own land. So when they heard that Canada, through Homestead Act, was offering 160 acres of free land for whoever would settle in Western Canada, that became very attractive to the Assyrians to come and have their own farms and live in a Christian country. So that was the main reason of attraction. However, and um, Isaac Adams um, brought Assyrians to Canada two times, one, once in 1903, the second time he went back to, in 1907 and he brought a second group to settle in Canada. But the harsh um, Canadian prairie winters made farming very, very difficult for the Assyrians. So in 1910, uh, Isaac Adams negotiated with a land company in California and brought, about, uh, and brought those Assyrians who were willing to relocate with him to the United States. And on the way, they recruited even more people from Chicago. And he brought all this group, 50 of them, to settle in Turlock. So the Assyrians were kind of on the move again. First time because of oppression, they came from their homeland back to Canada and then the harsh winters pushed them a second time and uprooted them and so they came and settled in Turlock. Pretty soon after the initial settlement, uh, more people from uh, the homeland wanted to come and settle in Turlock. So Turlock became a big name in Urmia. And there's a very funny anecdote about um, one Assyrian who came to settle in Turlock, and um, on the way he had to stop in New York. And when um, he went about and saw the big roads in New York and the skyscrapers, he said, hey, Babi, in Aha, New York, you love us, see Turlock, my Oh my gosh. If this is New York, imagine what Turlock will look like. <laughs> of course, Turlock was just a small village. But after, um, after the initial settlement, uh, when World War I uh, took place and the Assyrians were uprooted, large numbers of Assyrians came to Turlock, and so Turlock com Assyrian community really became much larger. At one time, there were 19 Assyrian refugees uh, uh, stranded in uh, Angel Island, and um, Isaac Adams and some other Assyrians, like Peter George, what they did is that they uh, kind of uh, offered, placed their lands, their farms, as security to bring those people out of that uh, situation and settle them in Turlock. So really, the community was very close, and they were trying to help each other in any way uh, that they could. Um, the, uh, the pioneer generation of Assyrians um, practiced their traditional way of life. There were no telephones. There was no TV. So people had communal dinners. They cooked their traditional food, kada, dolma, kipte, and they shared it as one large family together. Some of them even built tanuires in their backyard and baked their own breads and kada and other Assyrian pastries. What is interesting is that the pioneer generation never referred to each other by their last name. They only refer to each other by their village name. So they would call each other, for example, Butros Tutrash, Yosef um, Gavilan. 
Uh, the way that uh, here in America you would call somebody um, like uh, Peter, New England, uh, Butros, uh, San Francisco. Why were they doing this? Because the village was mark of identity. Each village has its own character. So people of some villages were known as happy-go-lucky people. Uh, people from another village might be known as very quarrelsome. Some villages were no, called high-nosed people because they were richer than the other people. So uh, it was a marker of identity uh, for people depending on uh, which villi village they came from. Uh, uh, okay. I have the picture of the first generation. Now, this is the Rancher's Directory uh, in 1926. It gives us very detailed information about each family regarding their names, the size of the farm they had, and even the model and the year of the car that they owned. Um, I can see the very first uh, uh, family uh, that I want to show as an example. That, he lived, that, that family lives in Modesto. And what? The name of the uh, wife is Alina. I can't read the name of the husband, but notice that they're driving a Ford truck um, 23. So there are about 40 lists of uh, Assyrians in this rancher's directory and with, with all the detailed information about them. Question. Were the Assyrians accepted in the Turlock larger community? Well, yes or no. Uh, they were accepted as co-religionists, but not as equals. Um, when the pioneer generation came, uh, of Assyrians came to Turlock, they had no churches of their own. So the Swedes let them attend the Swedish church. But after a few years, when the young Assyrian men started making friends with the Swedish girls, then they were kicked out of the church. And I asked them, why were you kicked out? And they said, because they said we were black. <laughs> so they started looking at their skin to see if they were really black. And this was actually a blessing in disguise because it forced the Assyrians to go and establish their own church, their own club, and begin to speak uh, Assyrian and keep their identity this way. Otherwise, they would have become assimilated very fast into the Turla community. <laughs> One of the first generation of Assyrians that came from Chicago into Turla were the uh, Hubiar family. Um, this is a newspaper clipping from 1972. It is the centennial of the establishment of Turlock as a town. And the newspaper indicates uh, uh, Arbi Hubiar uh, in his traditional Assyrian costume. The Hubiars was, was the first generation of Assyrians that moved out of farming into um, business, entered into the business world. R.B. Hubiard opened a restaurant in Turlock, and a Syrian, because of their fondness for nicknames, started calling him Bob Hamburger. <laughs> His sister, Arlene, went, to, uh, went into real estate business. The clipping also shows the very first establishment of the Assyrian Civic Club back in 1946. Although Assyrians are uh, a very small minority in Turlock, but they have historically about 3 to 4 percent of the total population, but they are the most visible ethnic group in Turlock. Uh, there are numerous Assyrian landmarks in Turlock with Assyrian title. 
For example, in the 1960s, there were six churches with the title Assyrian on them. Nowadays, I hear these have increased to 12 denominational churches with Assyrian as their title. I will just show you a few examples of uh, churches in Turlock. This is the very first non-denominational church that was built in 1924 when the Assyrians were kicked off of the Swedish church. Unfortunately, this church is abolished today, doesn't exist anymore. Assyrian Evangelical Church built in 1950s. And this is St. John's Assyrian Presbyterian Church uh, built in 1940s. Maradi Assyrian Church built again in 1947. Uh, Larsa Banquet Hall belongs to the Church of the East. It was built in 1980s. It's a, it's a very elegant hall. Uh, for entertainment. St. Thomas Assyrian Chaldean Church um, in Turlock. This is uh, the Assyrian American Civic Club and it is one of the largest banquet halls in, all, uh, in the town. And what you notice is the Assyrian identity on it. You will see the conical shapes on the walls, which are copies of the Assyrian palaces in Nineveh, which I will show in a minute, but also see the Lamassu on the long post there. And this is copied from the ancient Assyrian um, Nineveh monument. You will notice the conical shapes on the walls that have been copied there. This is the Beit Nahrain Cultural Center in Sirius. Again, notice the uh, conical shapes on the walls. I want to talk about some of the prominent Assyrians in Turlock. The first one I'll talk about is John Sargis, was one of the early pioneers. He was a very well-known um, dentist. He uh, was educated in the United States. He had 40 acres of farmland in Keys. 40 acres were large because most of the Assyrians owned 10 to 15 acres. So he was a very rich Assyrian there. His daughter told me that um, his home was a sightseeing so uh, site. You know why? because it was the very first uh, house in uh, Turlock that had indoor plumbing, and people came to see the tiled bathroom in the house. This is Philip Malik, came from Iraq, and he had a mobile uh, core, home park uh, that he established in Sirius. And he called it Nineveh Estates. And all the streets that, I, as I drew in, they had uh, Assyrian names, like Babylon Street and uh, Shamiram Court, and so on and so forth. So he, <laughs> he established the little Nineveh in his, um, uh, par in his trailer park. Have you heard of Uncle Ben's converted rice? Well, the inventor was Milton Malik. I want now to talk about some of the important Assyrian comp contributions to the culture of Turlock. Although the Assyrians are one of the smallest ethnic group in Turlock, they have made significant and lasting contributions to the cultural and horticultural heritage of the town. First of all, in terms of horticulture, they introduced new varieties of grapes and new uh, varieties of fruit trees that didn't exist in Turlock. They brought them back uh, and planted them in this area. Um, the Assyrian pioneers helped the development of the town by opening up streets turning dirt roads into paved roads. For example, 
Joseph Adams, that's the brother of Isaac Adams. Odisha Bacchus came from Canada. Albert Tamras, George Peters, I'm just mentioning a few names, donated part of their land to open up 9th and 10th streets and widen other narrow streets. Jerry James, some of you might, those from Chicago, might know this person. He was a real estate development. And he developed part of the Turlock town. And he named some of the streets that he opened up after the name of his sons. So we have Kenneth Street, Edward Street, and Turlock. Later on, uh, Jerry James moved to Chicago, and he became a very famous real estate de developer. He built high rises there. The library of uh, University of uh, California in um, uh, Turlock has some remarkable pieces in it that really give pride and joy to the Assyrians. Um, this one is a piece, a rubbing on rice paper, uh, dated 8th century uh, AD comes from China, and it depicts, depicts the name of the bishops that brought Christianity to China. And um, as you see uh, at the bottom level, there's Assyrian scripts, and these are all the names of the bishops that served at the Church of the East in China back in the 8th century. As you enter the library of the uh, university, uh, two busts greet you. One of them is Shamiram, the other one is the bust of Ashurbanipal, and these were made and donated uh, by our artist, uh, Fred Farhat. The Syed collection is a, again, is in the university library. It has a thousand volumes of rare and priceless books that are housed in this um, library, and they depict the Assyrian history, culture, and religion. And in recent years, our lawyer, Francis Sergis, established a fund for a teaching position at the university there, and also uh, to uh, subsidize uh, lectures on the Assyrian history and literature. Today, Turlock is no longer a farming community. It has become a service center with strip malls, department stores, supermarkets. It has grown into a sprawling city with a population of over 74,000 people and serves as a bedroom community for the larger metropolitan areas of San Francisco and San Jose. It has become a major retirement home for the Assyrians who come to spend their last years from all over the United States in Turlock. Thank you for listening. I wanted to thank again our wonderful panel. Um, this panel here is important to me personally and I hope to you all as well. Not only when it comes to learning more about our community's history and having a glimpse into our panelists' areas of expertise, but it is particularly significant for all of us to see and meet such accomplished Assyrian academics those here with us on the panel and uh, others who have joined us this weekend. It is a rare and beautiful thing to see someone from your own community become accomplished in spheres like academia. Not only does your work itself contribute indescribably to our community, but the influence you all have to inspire as role models to future generations to be, is beyond impactful to the Assyrian community. So thank you all.
And we're going to take some time for, for questions, so please raise your hand. Yes. It was mentioned that some of the books uh, on the Assyrians were uh, in print. They are actually printed out. So the Assyrian, the history of Assyrians and Hamadan, the three volumes of Katini Gabara, the grammar book of William Daniel, as well as the last days of Atlakendi, uh, are all in print and uh, you're welcome if you're interested to have copies of them. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was wondering how we can find unique sources outside of the usual searches that we do. Um, like what are any kind of advice or tips you have for us to find better, stronger sources? Okay, um, thank you very much for that question. It's a great question. So um, I'm gonna pass it to Ruth in a second. She can talk a little bit more about the archive. But I just wanna say the majority of the material that we have or that we have not utilized yet probably exists in your basements and your attics and in the basements and attics of your family. And I say this because um, when my brother and I and my parents were cleaning out the house of my, my father's um, uh, great aunt and uncle, um, uh, Elia, Uncle Elia, Elia, excuse me, Donabed, what was one of the interesting things that we found was that they, they had kept, I mean, the generation, that early generation kept a lot of their stuff. If, the, if it didn't just get tossed, which also happened, um, they kept it, and they kept it well. We found a suitcase of um, a newspaper, which some of you may know, Le Shonot Umtho, who, thanks to Esther, has now been digitized. Um, yes, extremely important. It's a Syrian newspaper that was published uh, in Beirut by Ibrahim Hakwardi, and it was predominantly, in, I mean, it was an Assyrian script, in the Western Assyrian script, but um, a lot of Gershuni language, but some Assyrian as well. What was interesting is that we never had that before. So now we found an entire, it was in a suitcase. We, might, we walked into the house, there was a flood in the basement, we were cleaning up, we thought, oh, what's this? It's an old suitcase. We popped it open, and there is a bound copy, bound with rope, of this entire newspaper, the entire collection that they had. And we found duplicates too, and some of them went to the Ashurbani Paul Library, and uh, I believe the others went to Harvard, Harvard University. So this stuff exists, I guarantee it exists in people's houses and people tend to forget that it's there. And I would just say the other source is the living memory. And we always talk about parents and grandparents, but each and every one of these people has a story to tell. And for a good portion of Assyrians' lives, we have been an oral community, especially in the last couple hundred years. Those stories disappear if they are not kept. So we tend to think only of those written sources, but equally as viable, and perhaps in many cases more important, are these oral sources. Every one of those oral sources um, can be utilized just the same way as you use a written source. So I would say record, record, record. Because when these folks are gone, when all of us are gone, if our stories are not told, that information, that data, those anecdotes disappear with, with these people. And I'll, I'll pass it to Ruth. Please. Sargon really answered the question, but I can tell you, again, like I said yesterday, sometimes we think things aren't as important, and so I have a wedding list from 1928. And on the wedding list, next to each guest's name, there's the amount that they gave as a gift, <laughs> um, but is, there's also the name of the village they were from. And it's so significant, what a historical document. And no one else I knew really saw it as this historical document. So it doesn't have to be a formally published item to be valuable. And yesterday, I don't know if Pam is out there, but there she is back there. She told me the story 
of keeping and storing her grandparents' furniture. Her husband thought she was crazy. What are we going to do with all this stuff, right? We, we pay for storage, and here it all is. Well, in cleaning it out, they found a wedding list very similar, okay? And you want to say something again? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just saying, first of all, Neil gets a lot of credit because it was my parents and my entire extended family, all my cousins, who thought I was crazy. Neil organized, we were living in Seattle. He and a friend of mine from high school, so two non Assyrians, organized getting the furniture into storage and moved it for me. And we kept it in storage for years while we were still out on the West Coast. Um, we, what I found was some books, which I brought with me today for somebody to look at. I don't know what they are. They're written in Assyrian. It could be that list. It could be something else. Um, but yeah, I also have the picture of my grandparents, my grandfather and his family coming to Ellis Island, which I rescued from the trash when I was young. My grandmother was literally putting it in the trash. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, they don't look very good. And I said, they just walked here from Iran. Of course, they don't look very good. <laughs> like, I'm keeping this. So you know, they, they did have a tendency to kind of clean things out and stuff, so. And, the, okay. I would like to urge the younger generation of our scholars um, to please do research on the villages uh, of the native where we lived, either in Iraq, in the Hakkari region, or in Urmia, to do research on the villages there, to preserve their history. Otherwise, if, the, if you do not document that, later on nobody will know that we are indigenous to the areas where we used to live. Another thing that I would like to urge you to do is that we have very little literature on the Assyrians living in the Hakkari district very little literature. Please do make an effort to do research. And especially what happened after the 1914 exodus of the Assyrians. What happened to the nation? They became all dispersed. Where did they go? Where did they settle down? This needs to be documented. Otherwise, our history will be wiped out after First World War. The one thing I would recommend, obviously there are the sort of go-to archives for anyone who's doing historical research. Um, now a number of institutions have made their uh, archival material available digitally. Um, I mean, I know the Library of Congress has started to roll out a lot of uh, Assyrian material in a digital format. Of course, the Assyrian Studies Association uh, and the, um, the Modern Assyrian Research Archive had a lot of digital material available. So a accessing material has, I think, probably, Sargon, you can say, I think has been a lot easier than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, for uh, scholars uh, of that generation. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of times a lot of the archival material can sort of pop up uh, out of nowhere. So the Reverend David case, um, was interesting in that I, I came across a short newspaper clipping, uh, and I, I showed it in the, in the presentation. Unfortunately, I sort of had to rush through at the end there. Um, but it was a uh, anniversary, a 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Assyrian United Evangelical Church of Chicago, sort of like a, a note in the newspaper celebrating its 25th anniversary. That was the Reverend Paul Newey's church um, in Chicago. So this is like around 1947, uh, 48. And in that newspaper, uh, in that article, uh, they mentioned how the Reverend Paul Newey uh, played a leading role in helping thousands of Assyrians attain citizenship, U.S. citizenship. And then it mentioned sort of at the end how he helped fight the test case of Reverend David in the 1920s. And, you know, anyone who's sort of familiar with the history of the Assyrians of Chicago, I mean, I remember I visited the old Assyrian United Evangelical Church years ago, and there's a plaque there honoring the memory of Reverend Newey. And the one thing that they highlighted was he helped thousands of Assyrians to attain citizenship. And if you talk to some of the more, like the old timers, they all mention that. And I thought, okay, well, this is like an interesting thing that everyone keeps mentioning and bringing up. 
Like, but what's the deal with it? Like, I don't understand. Like, I'm sure, you know, okay, he helped a lot of Assyrians and all that, but why is this particular note about him constantly remembered? And then that article sort of pointed me in the direction of like, oh, there was a case. And the, case, and the article mentions it went to the Supreme Court. It did not go to the Supreme Court. It was a federal case in Illinois. And then, you know, I started uh, reaching out to the National Archives because they hold all of these sort of immigration cases, you know, trying to locate it. Um, then COVID happened <laughs> and I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, but then eventually when the archives reopened, they were like, oh, actually we did find the case. And they sent me the PDF copy, um, right? And so it was very unconventional. It was all kind of by chance that I came across all of this information. I think a lot of that material is, that's just one way uh, that that can happen is just sort of by chance that something um, sparks your interest and you ask a few questions and dig around a little bit and then you find this entire thing that um, you know, no one has ever seen before, so. Thank you all. Our next question. My question is for Dr. Donovan. So, Sargun, can you talk a little bit about the impact that the Simel massacre had on Assyrian identity for Assyrians in the United States and in the Middle East, and the importance of learning about that? That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Remsen, for that. So, uh, a Simel massacre. There's, there are a variety of sources about the Samil massacre, of course, um, and the impact that it had on the United States, the Assyrians in the United States, but the Assyrians globally, was probably, I mean, it was probably the most influential event um, that solidified the necessity for Assyrian associations in diaspora in order to speak at times when, when Assyrians in the Middle East cannot speak for themselves. So solidify those associations, create sort of a sense of, of, of power and agency um, outside of the Middle East to speak when Assyrians in the Middle East couldn't. Um, it's where you see the development of the Assyrian National Federation, right, Assyrian American National Federation. Uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, all happened after 1933. Um, the, the problematic nature of 1933, though, of course, also catapulted um, in my opinion, from my research, the division of the Assyrian identity. Um, it's in 1933 that you start to see the distinctions uh, or this, this fear of identifying as Assyrian. You see it in the, if you just go to, go to, um, is it College Park? College Park, Moore Park, I always forget which one it is, where the National Archives are here in Washington. Uh, if you go to the National Archives, you can see a lot of the American demo, uh, documents on Samael. And the American observers that were in uh, Iraq at the time, one of them, Paul Kabenshu, talks a lot about the impacts on, on the Assyrians, you know, as from an observer perspective. Um, but what, what's really interesting is that we have responses from members of different ecclesiastical communities, from bishops of the Syriac Church, bishop of, bishops of the, or prelates of the um, Syriac Orthodox Church, um, some stuff from, from other locals as well. But you start to see, in some cases, a distinction between themselves and those who identified. And I'm not doing this in scare quotes to say that I disagree with the Assyrian identity, but because this is what they, they started to think of Assyrian, quote unquote Assyrian, as being only those, quote unquote, Nestorians of Urmia and Haikari. And that's where you start to see the development uh, of this problematic understanding of Assyrians as only those people. We internalized it. We meaning we Assyrians. Many Assyrians from different groups began to internalize, oh, look what happens when you are Assyrian. And so you start to see a community shift in different places, especially in places like Syria with the Syriac Orthodox communi community because they were on that front line of seeing the distinction between, oh, if you are an adamant Assyrian, you will be eliminated, like they're doing to these people in Iraq. And of, so, of course they saw that because that was also the time period when the Syriac Orthodox Church, the headquarters moved from Turkey, right, from remote southeastern Turkey in the Turabdin region to Syria, the newly f minted country of Syria, right? So at that time period, you know, what do you try to do? It's a new country of Syria, Syria the new Arab Republic of Syria, growing Arab nationalism, and then 1933 happens. And there's these troublesome Assyrians. You, you, you keep them at arm's length. And you say, oh, Assyrian, that's those people. We are distinct from that. 
And these do what's, what's interesting about these archival documents is they, each one that we find, I think really solidifies how you start to see that. Um, whether or not that was done, and, and that's the great part about some of these documents, even in the American archives, because these are observer documents, um, they didn't necessarily have a, a, a major interest in Iraq at the time, not like the British, for instance. And you see that, that distinction where they would say, oh, well, even if it was done at the barrel of a gun, right, like, like under threat, these other groups were very hands off and said, oh, congratulations, you know, um, Iraqi military and Iraqi um, uh, government for what you did. Now, that's very, very interesting because eventually over time, of course, that becomes solidified and it actually becomes the mask that they wear. They start to basically not just distance themselves from being Assyrian, but also um, internalizing that distinction and seeing themselves as a different community. So I think 1933 is that major piece of sectarianization, internal sectarianization that you see, not just external. The United States is distinct because it brings people together for a time. But then those sectarian divisions from the Middle East slowly trickle into the community and diaspora as well. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm, a pro I'm sorry, I have to say, I'm a product of Assyrians of two different communities. My parents' generation, okay, my mother's side of the family eventually moved to New Britain, Connecticut. My parents met, okay, at an Assyrian New Year party in New Britain, Connecticut. My father came from the Assyrian community in Massachusetts, the Harput community. My father was born in the United States. My great-grandparents' graves are in Massachusetts. So we have two very distinct communities. One is a Jacobite community, the other was Church of the East slash Presbyterian slash, I don't know, the, all the other connections as well, Catholic slash all the other ones, but mostly from Urmia that settled in New Britain. Most of the time, they went to each other's parties. Same with the Yonkers community. That was the reason that you had Durna, Perli. Durna is Diyarbakirli. Um, uh, Perli was a Kharputli. Um, the Jacobs, these were uh, Ormishnaya. Yeah. So you, yeah, so you have these people from a variety of different places coming together with Assyrian as a common denominator. Once you get into the 50s, that's when you get the distinction. And, and we see that very much so starting in 33, but by the 1950s, that's when you get the real distinction. Okay. Um, because it, it, that influence comes through those Middle Eastern institutions and then starts to affect the ones in the West as well. That's the most fascinating piece about it. Right. Anyway, this is like <laughs> uh, six books and a lecture. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Dr. Donabed. Appreciate it. Apologies, everyone. We only have time for, for one more quick question because we want to, to get the day moving to get to our workshops. Um, and if we can keep the responses short, please. I know you guys have a wealth of knowledge that we want to tap into, but we can ask um, hopefully after after this. Thank you. Thank you all to all the panelists. That was great. My question is for Dr. Ishaya. Um, when we discuss about the cultural contributions that our various regions in our homeland contribute, um, um, our culture and our, our like uh, literature and art comes from Urmi often. When we talk about the diaspora in Turlock, you, you really emphasize agrarian and kind of rural culture. So my question is, why do we see that shift for the diaspora community being more rural and like, um, I guess, farm and agrarian versus when we discuss that community in our homeland, we often emphasize the contributions to art, culture, um, and literature. I'm not sure if I understood your question well, but I'll do my best to answer. Um, <clears throat> yes, the Turlock community was looked upon as an agrarian community. And actually what happened is that in the 1940s, a lot of Assyrians from Chicago came to retire in Turlock. And they started looking down upon this indigenous Assyrian community in Turlock because they were from big city, Chicago city, and these were just small farmers. So you, you can see the first division that happens in Turlock. And later on in the 1960s, Assyrians from, Turlo from Iraq came to Turlock. So there was further 
diversification in the Syrian population of Turlock. So your, your other question is the contributions of the cultural contributions of Assyrians. I don't understand that. Okay, so the bad news is the panel's over, but the good news is they are all gonna be part of the workshop that's going to take place in about 20 minutes. Um, so what, you should have gotten a text message that, oh, sorry, first of all, let me say thank you to this remarkable panel. One more <laughs> round of applause.